Okay, now to another issue and another listener, Robin from Hanover, New Hampshire, were, apparently heard us talk at the beginning of the show that we were going to be discussing the changes in the SAT, and she wants us to get to that now. <laughs> uh, Robin says, the redesign of the SAT tests, SAT <clears throat> tests sound to me like one more step in the dumbing down of American, ed- of American education. A Washington Post story says the College Board hasn't yet cited examples of words deemed too obscure, but... Punctilious, phlegmatic, and occlusion are three tough ones in the College Board Study Guide. Okay, maybe we should back up a little bit here and talk about um, talk about what these changes are in the SATs and whether, in fact, they are amounting to a dumbing down of the test. Chuck, all of those of us who've had kids prepare for college know the nightmare around SAT tests. Uh, absolutely. I'm, I'm so glad my kids are past that age. Um, you know... I, I think you could argue that, um, and, and I, I'm not an expert on this topic, I did see that two of the words, uh, vocabulary words they're getting rid of are, are, are prevaricator and sagacious. And I'm thinking, you know, if you're trying to teach our children how to write... <laughs> if you want to teach them to understand American politics, those are two important exactly. words. Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, liar is a good short word for prevaricator. <laughs> Wise is a good short one-syllable word for uh, sagacious. And, you know, Mark Twain said something along the lines of, don't use a fancy 50-cent word if you can use a good old 5-cent word. Word. So from a writing standpoint, I think it's just as fine that they not uh, focus on prevaricator and sagacious. But, the, you know, the caller does have a point that um, you could argue that uh, by, you know, we're getting away from some of the tougher things that back in our day we had to study. Yeah. That's not the only change, though, in the SAT Well, yeah. I, I am on both sides of this divide. I am the mother of a high school junior, mm-hmm. and I'm also <laughs> the mother of a college senior. And one thing that they are responding to are competitive pressures. For instance, um, the college my son goes to, Wake Forest, a few years back decided to make test optional because they looked at those SATs and they thought, you know, this is not such a great indicator of whether this kid is going to do well in our, you know, very competitive academic environment. They're just not giving us the information we need about the kids. So, uh, you know, that's another thing that they are, are going after here. And, you know, Jeff Mason, you have to look at this within the context of the testing industry. And I understand that SAT was actually losing market share to its rival, the ACT. Losing some ground to the ACT, yes. And that's one thing they were responding to and also responding to studies that show uh, that children of higher income families and that come from higher income households were doing better uh, in the SAT. And that may be partially because of the money their parents were willing to spend on expensive SAT prep courses. And so they they wanted to take that factor out. They're also offering some uh, free prep courses online. And one of the biggest changes that they're making is taking out the essay requirement, which was not a requirement when I took the yeah. SAT. Um, and they're taking that out now and returning to that standard 1600 top score. And one of the thing, one of the ideas apparently is to align the SAT a little bit more with the Common Core, so that there is a sort of a, a, a unity in terms of what students are studying in school and then tested on in order to get into college. Right, making it more accessible, but also just more in line with what kids are learning, and that would ideally make it more of a level playing field for everyone as well.